Welcome, everybody. So nice to have you here. Uh, welcome to South Orange Library's Special Conversations. I'm Laura Sims, and I'm really excited to have these three amazing writers from Montclair with us tonight. Um, first, there's Catherine Dykstra. Is it Dykstra? Mm -hmm. Yes, OK, good. Um, who wrote this amazing true crime book called What Happened to Paula. And one of the things that's really amazing about it is that it transcends the genre in many ways. Um, and we'll talk about that. And Lori Lico Albanese, um, whose latest novel is this really engaging and sweeping historical fiction called Hester. And Marcy Dermansky, I should be indicating each of you, sorry, that's Lori and Lori. <laughs> um, and Marcy Dermansky, whose latest brilliantly unique novel is Hurricane Girl which I read in, I think, like a day or <laughs> two <laughs> days max. Yes, yeah. same. Ate it up. Right. Uh, um, so even though the books are really vastly different in many ways, they do share this one trait, which is, or they share other traits as well, but they share this one trait, which is to kind of re-examine and um, look at, at women characters in this multi- various way and um, and make them kind of break away from the stereotypical ways we think about we've thought about women that we've seen women portrayed in in literary fiction and nonfiction um, so I'll tell you more about each of our guests Catherine Dykstra like I said is the author of what happened to Paula um, which was a New York Times best book of summer a people magazine best summer read and one of crime reads top 10 true crime books of 2021. Named an artist to watch by Creative Capital, her essays have been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Poets and Writers, Real Simple, and Guernica, among others. And Lori Lico Albanese, in the middle, is the author of the novel Hester, chosen as a Book of the Month club pick and an Indie Next Great Reads pick. Um, she's also written two other novels and a memoir, Stolen Beauty, Blue Suburbia, and Linnell by the Sea. She is the co-author of the novel The Miracles of Prato. Lori's books have been translated into Spanish, French, German, and Portuguese. And Marcy Dermansky is the author of the critically acclaimed novels Hurricane Girl, Very Nice, The Red Car, Bad Marie, and Twins. She's received fellowships from the McDowell Colony and the Edward F. Albee Foundation. She lives with her daughter in Montclair, New Jersey. So welcome, all three of you. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, and I wanted to, I think we're going to start by having each of you read a very brief excerpt, right? Um, so whoever wants to go first, please do. Yes. These are the only ones that were available on the shelf. You know so they're cute. <laughs> you know, they're a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so who would like to start us off? Okay, you're start. ready? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna read the preface. Okay. Does that sound okay? That sounds great. It's like four pages. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure exactly how long. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Hi, thank you for coming. Uh, under a washed out winter sky, I steered a rented car away from downtown Cedar Rapids, Iowa. My travel companion was my mother-in-law, the fiction writer Susan Taylor Chihop. Our destination, a slip of land that spooned the Cedar River. I need my reading glasses. Yeah. Try it, try them. I don't even know what they are. It's too much. Sure, it's too much. <laughs> Um, yes. Here, do I try it? <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will suffer. These are like two. These are like two. You shouldn't suffer. Sorry, okay. Oh, it's, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, it's just got to be like in the right spot. No, that's okay. That's fine. Oh, dear. Wait, I have another choice. I appreciate the legacy. I'm going to. Okay. 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 Um, uh, my travel companion was my mother in law, the fiction writer, Susan Taylor T. Hawk. Our destination, a slip of land that spooned the Cedar River. The area was just outside the city proper, but felt otherworldly, barren, desolate, removed. Heading south on Otis Road, the river lays flat and gray on our right. 
the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad tracks ran silver on our left. Beyond them, Van Vecten Park's wooded darkness stretched up a steep hill. We passed a giant smoking factory, a cold freight train heavy on its track, and a, and a handful of Canadian geese who never made it south for the winter. When Susan indicated, I pulled off onto Miller Lane, a narrow gravel drive that jutted up from Otis, thus far the, the byway's only interruption. I stepped out of the car into the bitter air and followed Susan through the snow, which came up over my shoes. After intersecting with the railroad tracks, the drive continued uh, under a gate and up through private property until it dead-ended in a horse farm on the hill. Private drive and no trespassing signs were nailed to trees and staked into the ground before it. We turned right at the tracks, trudging over the ties for about 20 paces until Susan stopped abruptly, turning toward the river. Here, she said. Across the cedar lay Mount Trashmore, the city's landfill. The puffing stacks of the Cargill cereal plant loomed in the distance. At my feet, I found a rocky crevasse that sloped back down toward Otis. And there, sticking out amid a cascade of steel gray rocks was the culvert. A culvert is a pipe that diverts rainwater under railroad tracks in order to prevent their flooding. I had gone my whole life and had never encountered the word, but now it was everywhere. That's where Paula Keen over Brockling's body had been found, just beyond the mouth of this culvert. Paula was 18 years old when she disappeared in the summer of 1970. It's been 50 years and her killing has never been solved. In the summer of 2008, seven years before I looked down into that culvert, I tagged along with my then boyfriend and his family to Cedar Rapids, where the goal was to shoot footage for a documentary film about Paula. Susan, my boyfriend's mother, had attended the same high school as Paula. The two never overlapped, missing each other by a year, but in, in adulthood, Susan had become fixated on Paula's story, filled as it was with conflicting narratives and unreliable narrators, with hearsay and speculation. Paula's was the story of a small city and small city police, of disappointment and squandered potential, of race and class and sex. A story that became more complex the deeper one dug. A story all the more comp compelling for the fact that it had been mostly forgotten, even though the case still yawned wide open. Susan was haunted by its lack of resolution. During the lead up to the trip, Susan asked if I was interested in helping out with the film. As a journalist, I was equipped to conduct interviews or brainstorm lines of inquiry. But I had no interest in, in considering the grisly death of a young woman. It frightened me. I was 31 in 2008, and in a stretch of my life, I now think of as before, by which I mean before marriage, before children, and before everything that comes tethered to being responsible for the lives of others. Basically, I was in a time of my life that was easy. I was in love, and I had a raft of writing and editing jobs that kept me afloat and afforded me the lease on my small Brooklyn apartment. But even more, I had the extreme privilege of not having to complicate that ease with the sticky web of real life. It wouldn't be until after marriage, children, that my life, specifically my life as a woman, would kaleidoscope, appearing so different, differently that not only would I agree to involve myself in the story of this young woman's death, but I'd find myself unable not to, convinced as I was that I owed her. That decision would lead me down a long and circuitous path that began with the arrogant certainty that I could solve Paula's death when others had not, and evolved into a different goal. For over the course of the years I spent researching and writing Paula's story, it dawned on me that what I wanted to say about her death was less true crime and more sociological study. Meaning, though a girl had been killed, and though the details of her disappearance and death are important and will be included in the pages of this book, this is not about a murderer. I do not know who killed Paula Oberbrocklin. What I do know is that the onus of her death extends well beyond whoever dumped her body down that hill. This is the story of the grave injustice served one girl and all the factors that conspired to allow, even ensure that injustice. It is about the reasons it was easier for the authorities in Cedar Rapids to forget what happened to Paula than to face it. It is about the ways in which women are the same and how we are different, and the role society played then and plays now in our choices and in our opportunities or lack thereof. 
It's about legacy and the things that are handed down between women over generations. It's about the women in Paula's family and the women in my own. It's about women who lived in Cedar Rapids in the 1960s and women who also lost mothers, sisters, daughters to violence. It is infuriating, but maybe it is also hopeful. My hope is that by giving Paula voice, by interrogating the generally accepted story of her life and death, by searching for nuance, I might pay my debt not only to her for showing me that my womanhood is important and powerful and comes with responsibility, but to the long continuum of women before me and to come, to the women who shaped me, my mother, my grandmother, Susan, my friends and mentors, to women I don't even know, and to the one little girl, one day a woman, who, when I began this quest, had yet to be born. Thank you. Would you like me to read like that much? Because I, I have so much. that much. No, I, you didn't. <laughs> Mine is a natural break there. Has yeah, a natural remember. break in that same amount of pages. <laughs> the, I didn't mean that much as in that was too much. <laughs> I meant sorry. shall I read the same amount. I'm sorry, I didn't. I did. I did. You can, way. you can, you can read shorter. I'm going to read okay. the same. Okay. The same. <laughs> it's what I usually would do. Like it's that. where I would usually, I'm going to read a lot. Okay, the only thing you need to know about this book when I start reading it for you is that it, um, synesthesia is an element in the book, which is when people have. Um, their uh, sensory uh, uh, input crosses, so you might see color when someone speaks, or you might see color when you hear music. So my character has synesthesia, but the story takes place in 1829, and so nobody knows what synesthesia is. One. <clears throat> Salem was meant to be a new beginning, a place where the sharp scent of cinnamon and tea perfumed the air with hope a place where the colors could be safe and alive in me. I was 19 years old and Nathaniel Hawthorne was 24 when we met on those brick streets. His fingers were ink-stained. He was shy but handsome. The year was 1829 and we were each in our own way struggling to be free. He with his notebooks, I with my needle. Some people will tell you that Nat spent the better part of a decade after boating college alone in his room learning how to write. But that's a reputation meant for the ages. The true story of how he found his scarlet letter and then made it larger than life begins when I was a child in Scotland and he was a fatherless boy writing poetry that yearned and mourned. Sometimes I still picture him in my mind, a lonely nine-year-old boy with a bad limp and a mop of dark hair standing at the edge of the Massachusetts Bay waiting for a ship. He knows that his father has died of yellow fever somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, yet the boy is waiting with pencil at the ready. Something in him knows, I believe this even after all this time, that although his father will never return, a story just as powerful is coming toward him. It is me, bent into the wind, fleeing home with my colors and my needle, and my own set of needs and dreams. It's me, with my red letter secreted away. Like all the women in my family, okay, like all the women in my family, I was born in a stone cottage in the town of Abington beside the River Clyde. I had red hair and green blue eyes and was named Isabel for my grandmother, just as my mother was named Margaret for her grandmother. For hundreds of years we've been Isabel, Margaret, Isabel, Margaret, a chain of women going back and back through time, my mother said, and I liked the way it sounded, all of us red haired girls stitched together like paper dolls. I lived in a world of magic and color then. My mother's voice, a sapphire stream flecked with emeralds. My father's, a soft caramel. In summer, I ran barefoot through the valleys with my cousins and kin and saw their voices rise up in vibrant wisps of yellow and gold. The wind was sometimes fierce pink, and the sound of the waterfall on rocks glistened silver. I didn't know my colors were unusual, and so I never thought to speak of them just as I never remarked on the air, or the feel of a blanket at night, or the bark of my father's laugh that I loved so well. Every year at the summer sol solstice, we burned a bonfire and danced around the maypole, and in winter we hung mistletoe <coughs> in the cottage. Pop spoke of fairies who lived beneath the bay trees, of selkie seals who swam ashore and enchanted the lovelorn, and of brave clansmen who died fighting the English. A horse with a shining wet mane is a kelpie come to take you away. My father's voice spooled caramel as he shook a warning finger at me. And if you swim in the river and leave your clothes after the bean knife, you'll steal your soul and that will be the end of you. 
Don't frighten her, Mom scolded, and Pop put a finger up as if to warn me that this was our secret. But when we walked together looking for mushrooms in the spring, he spoke of sprites in white dresses who sat beside their river to wash the clothes of the dead, and of an unlucky lad who'd stumbled upon one and drowned the following day. My mother grew tight-lipped when Pop spoke of magical creatures and mysteries beyond God, but I knew by the gentle way my mother trimmed his beard, and by the way Pap held her at the waist when they danced around the bonfire, that theirs was a love bond, and that it would protect me. Their stories protected me too. Okay, one more little section. I was my mother's first child. Five years later, my brother Jamie came. While she was caring for him, Mom said it was time for my first sampler. She showed me how to make my letters first on a slate with chalk, then with needle and thread. One day you'll learn to read, she said. I didn't get far, but you will read books. I experimented with a thimble made of seal bone, then settled on a plain tin thimble that fit my finger. Tongue between my teeth, I worked carefully. When I fumbled and pushed the needle beneath my fingernail, I never cried out. Young though I was, I was full of obedient determination. I was preparing a green thread for the letter D when my mother came up behind me. What have you done? Is it wrong? I studied my work. It was neat and straight. I gave you black thread to make the letters in black. But A is red, I said quietly. Like the colors in the wind and the hue of my mother's voice, this had come to me without intention or fanfare. B is blue. C is yellow. No, they are not. My mother slapped my knuckles. The blow was hard and tears stung my eyes. She'd never struck me before. Never say that. She wasn't only angry, she was afraid. They'll call you crazy or say you're a witch. They'll say the devil's taken hold of you and they'll want to burn it out of you, do you hear? I'd heard whispered stories of witches hanged and burned in the fields of men and women who didn't defend against the devil and then found themselves full of evil and spite. Witches were spoken of in the past, but evil, insanity, and death were as plausible to me as Pap's silky seals. Isabel, do you understand? I nodded, but my mother shook me by the shoulders. She meant for me to be afraid. You have to defend against it, Isabel. Pray and be strong. Okay, so, so she sees this letter in red, and that's the pre preface to the Scarlet Letter. Right? Mm -hmm. This is the beginning of oh, right. This is the prequel to the Scarlet Letter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. How much are you going to read? Uh, well, I don't even know. So I'm going to read half of a section. But I'm gonna, all right. So the first two pages of this book, which I'm going to skip, you meet a character named Allison, and you find out that she spends all the money she has in the world. She's 32 years old to buy a beach house that she's never seen in North Carolina because she wants to get away from her boyfriend, and she had a family trip to North Carolina when she was a kid, and she loves it. So now we're on page three of the book. Okay. Allison had lived in her beach house for a week and a half when the hurricane warning came. Category 5, orders to evacuate. She spent the night in a motel. She drank gin and tonics, her father's favorite drink, and she watched the local news in her motel room. Her father, she knew, would have told her to buy the beach house. He would have told her, not for the first time, about the beach house that he did not buy years ago, a decision he regretted to his death. Alice's mother had not wanted to spend the money to take that risk. Whereas Allison had bought the house. It would be okay, that's what she told herself. And in the end, in fact, the storm was reduced to Category 3 and had toward north, turned north. Allison felt grateful to be spared. She got up, only slightly hungover, bought a coffee, and drove back to her house, which was gone. She did find it, but in pieces strewn all over the yard, wood beams and siding everywhere. The toilet from the second floor was upright in the same place on the ground. The red couch was precisely where it had been, in the living room that no longer existed. The roof lay in the middle of the road. Strangely, the steps up to the now absent porch were still intact. When Allison first heard about the storm, she imagined she would weather it, but then the winds picked up and she realized she was afraid. Her neighbor next door had nailed boards across his windows. Allison thought about asking him to help her. Allison did not, also did not want help from men. She did not like the look of her neighbor. He wore a baseball cap and had large muscles, wore te sleeveless t-shirts that said USA. <laughs> Buy a house, Allison said, as she sank down on the front of her steps, the front steps, clutching her cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee. That was all she could find that morning on the drive from the motel. I loved you. Allison was not sure what to do. She thought about sitting on the front steps, but probably that was not safe. She had spent so many good hours on the porch imagining her future. The house was insured, at least. She was not a complete idiot. 
You are an idiot, Allison said out loud with a sigh. Allison had a tendency to be unkind to herself. In this <coughs> case, it seemed warranted. Her mother, always a warrior, had advised her against the move. Her friend Lori had also been against it. You won't like it there, Lori had said. The beach might be good, sure, but think about hurricane season, Republicans, white supremacists. Allison had claimed not to be scared of such things. Well, then you are an idiot, Lori had said. <laughs> Allison often wished that she had a best friend who was nicer to her. Often it felt like not enough people were nice to her. Her next boyfriend, if nothing else, would be nice. Allison stretched her arms out to the sky. I think we'll stop there. Okay. <laughs> this is short and sweet. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, I was hoping that you could each talk a little bit about how your main character or person came to be the focus of, of your book. You want to start, Marcy? Yeah, I can start. You know, it's funny because in a way, like with this book, I didn't have a main character when I started. I just had an idea about what would happen if you bought your dream house and you lost it. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. And I do that right away. Like some people felt a little bit tricked because this book is called Hurricane Girl, and that's a hurricane. That's <laughs> an experience. That's, that's over. Hurricane. And then I just kind of wrote to see like what would happen. And as I wrote, but you were she, writing first person. First, I don't remember. No, no, third person. Well, third person. Third person. Yeah. I always like to stay third person because if you write in the first person, then it's a little bit too close and. The assumption of your reader, I feel often, is with is that it's going to be autobiographical, and it yeah. almost becomes as a writer if you write in the first person, then it becomes it slips too far. So I feel like mm -hmm. I like that bit of distance, and then she just sort of grows, and then yeah. when I figure things out. I put them back in the beginning, and I go back and forth. And yeah, so, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So it started with an idea. It just started with an idea. It didn't okay. even start with the main character. She developed yeah. as it went on. Okay. Yeah. How That's about you, Laura? Is her best friend's name really Lori? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. No, yeah. that's okay. But it's not Lori. It's not, it's not right. me, just no. for all who But it's also spelled L O R R I, which is very different. Yours is an A U R. Exactly. Yeah. What, I'll tell you one other last thing, though, about yeah. names is that there's, there's a bad guy in this book, and his name is Keith. And there are actually three bad guys oh. who are named Keith. And every once in a while in real life, I will meet men, and they're named Keith. And I feel kind of slightly <laughs> like, oopsie. Like, I'm your friend and husband's Keith. I said, oh, I'm sorry about your husband's name. And she's like, no, he's an asshole. So it was OK. But I hope your name isn't Keith. So with this Laura, she's nice. She comes back in the book. I remember. I remember I, her. Yeah, yeah but she's I do. Her, And she was actually semi-based on a friend of mine who's really flaky. And the flaky <laughs> friend is like, oh, she's nothing like me. Oh, that's really that's funny. Yeah. Wait, <laughs> is Julian's I sort of, husband's name Keith? Yeah, he did. See, and I didn't okay, know that. Okay, this anywhere. is being recorded. Yeah. And oh, we'll go up oh. on YouTube. Great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll do something. Yeah, and, sure. And hang on, we go. All right. So, <laughs> my, you know, my book is called Hester, and the character's name is not Hester. The character's oh, name Isabel. is Isabel. That's crazy. Right? Yeah. And so, um, but it is the prequel to The Scarlet Letter. And so, the way I chose the idea for the book was it came as a question. I wonder, you know, what if Hester Prynne could tell us her own story? I wonder if there was a real Hester Prynne. And then I went back and I thought maybe, first I thought maybe, and everyone remembers Hester Prynne from The Scarlet Letter, mm -hmm. right? So I went back and I thought, well, maybe I would tell her story as she exists in the Puritan times of The Scarlet Letter. Uh, and I quickly realized I didn't want to do that. Hawthorne had already done it. It wasn't a very pretty time. You know, what was I going to have her say? Um, so then I decided, well, maybe Hawthorne had had a love affair with someone when he was a young man. And there's plenty of opportunity in his life when that could have happened, and I can talk about that later. Um, and so I invented uh, a young woman who would not have been in his social circle, but is, an Irish, is a Scottish immigrant who comes over and meets Nathaniel Hawthorne, as I say in the first, as she says in the first chapter. And it's so interesting what you said about um, first person, because I always write in first person. In fact, I'm re revising a book that my editor said, well, maybe if you wrote it in first person, it would be more powerful. So, but so I think you had writing, done it in third. I had okay. done this, not this one, but the one I'm working on now. Yeah. yeah, and for me, it just, I always feel like there's a distance for me unless I'm writing first person. Yeah. So, I mean, just for me as a writer, not as a reader, I, I'll read all you know versions, first, second, and third, but for me as a writer, I find I work best in first or some version of first and second. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so she tells her story, but the name has the word the name Hester is literally never in the book. Mm -hmm. So a few people have said to me, 
You know that name Hester is never in the book. Really? Yeah, and I'm like, but you know what it's about, right? Um, so, and yeah. was that the title that you had in mind, or was that something kind of a smart marketing decision? No, or it was my title. title. Yeah, it, it was, was your my title? title. I okay. had it as I am Hester Prynne oh. because there were many iterations of this book before it became this character, and there were three different versions of the real Hester Prynne. Um, and so at some point it started out, you know, yeah. in the first section it said, I am so I am Hester Prynne, and I'm going to tell you what really happened, but um, it moved away from that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah. I feel I need to tell you guys that I, I am finishing up my first, my very first foray into fiction. Uh-huh. Um, and I'm writing in the first person. I think maybe because I, out, like, my nonfiction is always in first person, maybe obviously, mm -hmm. and... Um, jumping to third person, I think, felt like too big of a yeah. leap for me. Yeah. Yeah. Although mine is not autobiographical, so right. Mine's not either. I did not no. have a character <laughs> with, with, with Daniel, Daniel Hawthorne. Hawthorne. Right. right. You didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. Right. Right. In, in the novel, I he was. I never thought of you as like a time traveler. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I came to my uh, main character. Um, I just read the bit about going with my husband and his family to go shoot this documentary film, and I was like, I'm not interested in, you know, this, but it was so, what did interest me was that they, they were so fixated and focused on solving this crime, right? They're like, you know, trying to build timelines and put together scenarios and do all this, and, um, the, the one detail that I knew about this girl was that she was pregnant when she disappeared. Mm -hmm. And this was in 1970, it was three oh. years before Roe. And mm -hmm. the whole time I'm like, you guys, it's like, this is, this is a key to this story. Like a key to this story is the fact that she's pregnant. But uh, that wasn't something that really um, was motivating and driving to them. So when, the, when my mother-in-law came back to me years later after I'd been married and had my own child, and she was like, you should look at this. Like, all I could see in this story were the things that were sort of, like, set up against this poor girl. You know, she was, um, you know, likely pregnant when she disappeared. She had no access to, you know, any sort of reproductive care. She had, like, two boyfriends, one of whom was abusing her, the other of whom was black, and this was in 1968, and so her family was you know, horrible to her for that, and, you know, it was just like, all I could see were all the things that were set up uh, around her to, you know, basically force her down this path. Mm -hmm. um, so it took you many years to come back to that story, right? To yeah. Write it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, but yeah, I didn't come back to it until I realized how I, that, that I did, because my mother-in-law kept saying, like, I really think you should tell this story, and I was like, I don't, like, I, I didn't read true crime, I wasn't interested in true crime. And it wasn't until I sort of tumbled to that, like, oh, wait, isn't this interesting? Like, this girl had, you know, the time was set against her, and there's all these facets about it was okay to beat your wife in 1968, and, you know, like, all, just all of the things that were, were set up. Mm -hmm. um, and once I realized that, I was like, oh, I, I see how I can do this, mm -hmm. or I see how this is important. Mm -hmm. And do you That's think interesting. you'll write another nonfiction book? Of, uh, for sure, eventually, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a journalist right. and a nonfiction writer, so yes. Okay. <laughs> but not next. <laughs> That's right. Okay, great. Um, so it does seem like we're in this literary moment where writers are exploring more of the full spectrum of what and who women are, and that readers want more of that. Do you think that that's true? And if so, why do you think it's true? I think we Take should that. With it. I think we should say yes, it's true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, you know, like improv. Yes and. Yes <laughs> and. Okay. Um, so, I, I don't know. You know, I, I'm writing an update on a classic, and a lot of times the classics have been written by men, especially in this one. He wrote it. It was a man who wrote a story about a woman. So we can all lean into that and say, let's let the women have their say. And there is a lot, from my particular viewpoint, where where there's an update, you know, all the um, Madeline Miller books where you're getting mm -hmm. mythology told by the women <clears throat> who were kind of sidelined in the stories. And so for me, I think that 
you know, we can easily say that that has something to do with the Me Too movement, but I think it also has to do with the fact that women read more books than men, and they buy more books than men. Especially, so, right? you know, we want to read about ourselves. Yeah. yeah, so. I mean, in many ways, mine's a retelling too, right? Because the story of Apollo was that she was like, a slut and yes. nobody cared about, right? So it was yes. like, this was what, and, but if you reframe it and are like, wait a minute, she was a slut, why? Because she had a boyfriend and had sex? Like, mm, I think a lot of people do that. Like, right. you know, she's just a slut because she got caught, right? And um, the men called her a slut. Oh, yeah. First, the patriarchy oh, called her a slut. 100%. And the police right. and like, right. oh, she's dating a black guy. Okay, well, do we really think that's so bad? Like, you know, so all of the things that they kind of painted her as, looking back, it's, it's shocking and ridiculous, and yet, but yet, her story is still like I'm. You know, the people in Cedar Rapids, I still, I think, still sort of think of her the way that she was part of them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, in some ways, mine's a retelling too. I like, I like that. I like that. It's a reframing, right? Yeah. And we're all ready for reading reframing mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Yeah. Marcy, do you have anything to add? Sure. <laughs> well, I think one thing that I'm, I've been asked, like, for almost all of my books, starting with Bad Marie, is like the whole question about unsympathetic characters. Like, why do I write? You see, the grown and women are only men are never asked if their characters are unsympathetic. Unlikable. Unlikable. If I see that That's a, once yeah. more in a critique. Of oh my god! Guys. And I think I think for the most part, like that's all I write <laughs> are like women who are unsympathetic and unlikable and do things that are like really not like cool. I don't know, they're interesting, right? Like, what if we only wrote about women who had sex with who they were supposed to have sex with and we wouldn't write anything. And I think, I think that, like, it was weird when I first started writing a little bit and now, every, you know. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, so I think things have changed in a good way. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. yeah, people are hungry for it. Right. All three of our characters have sex with people they shouldn't have. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, that's a unifier. All right. That's right. That's but right. that's well, most that's interested in your book, I think, because you know you weren't supposed to have sex at all unless you were married. Right. right, and she's married, but to someone else. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. 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 And then. Yeah. And then. And then. <laughs> and then she's gonna <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're like Hester. Everybody. We're just retelling the Hester Prince story all over. Right. 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 You know. Yeah. Yes. A lot and of shame. My, right. Yeah, it's all about shaming women for passion. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And my next question is for you, Lori about that story like why do you think that story sort of the scarlet letter not exactly but that story is still relevant and like interesting for us today you mean the idea of of the scarlet letter the shaming of a yeah woman? and and what you've done also like to tell that backstory with i mean i think hester Prynne is just um you know, it's a phrase in the in the vernacular now. It's in the society. We all know what we mean when we say, you know, wear a scarlet A. And I just think it just resonates because people's that's still done. It's still done. We're still we're still having to answer, address that question, right? Like, why are we getting shamed for you know for being passionate? So I just think we. It's actually not that long ago. David Denby wrote a piece because I have it in my many many files of like why is the Scarlet Letter still relevant, you know? And I think why is Hester Prince still relevant because we're a Puritan nation, right? We 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 have origins in the Puritan nation, and we're watching it happen now. We're literally watching it in the news every day. The Puritans kind of like pushing up pushing up from the grave with what, what they're doing. Um, and so I think, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's still relevant, mm -hmm. is what I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And these stories tell it, too. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. right? What happens to your character? Well, don't tell, because uh, yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. But yes, yeah, there's a thing. punishment yeah. 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 of yeah. sorts. Mm -hmm. And Marcy, yes. my next question okay. is for you. So you kind of touched on this, we, that you do like, you know, you're, you write complicated, unlikable women, yeah. right? Um, why is it, do you think, and I'm thinking of like battery especially, yeah. but what what is it that draws you to those characters? Why do you like to write them? Do they give you some kind of permission as a writer? Well, there's always this idea of like control, right? Yeah. Like to, and that's just more control than I have. Like mm -hmm. when, I, when I sit to write, like I could always pretend to be like, this is what I intended to do. Right. I mean, and looking is, back. Yeah, I looking guess. back. Yeah. I, I tend to. I mean, how do you if, analyze yourself? 
Well, like my fourth novel is very nice. It's, it's got five points of view, and in that book there are two male points of view. And that was really the first time I had ever written from a male point of view. And I think I literally did that because somebody at my launch party for the red car is like, you don't seem to be interested in writing about men at all. And I was like, that's not true. <laughs> And then I realized that. it was totally true. And so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote that book. Yes, and, and. Yeah, yes, yes and then I totally liked, like, I had a very egotistical male writer, and he was really fun to write. Uh -huh. And then, yeah, and then tons of, tons of his inner thoughts, of course, because he was a writer, were me anyway. So, I mean, I don't know. So I don't know. I feel like there's so, if this is the wrong word, but I just feel like there's so much luck. Like, I just sit down to write, and it just happens, and it works. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just like, how it comes yeah, out. Yeah. 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 Well, do you ask yourself, like, what's the next weird thing that I can write? No. Interesting. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that I do, though? That's so interesting. No, because I, I heard you talk about your writing, and you, do, you always say, like, I just sit down and write the next yeah. thing. And I've heard other writers say, I just introduce the next problem. Right, well, there's that. Yeah. I mean, if I get really stuck, what I will just do is I'll just throw in a new character. I'm like, oh, oh that's that, interesting. Yeah, that, and I yeah. think that's great advice, and I give that to writers. If you don't know what you're going to do, just put something new in it, and something's mm -hmm. going to happen. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Or just put them in a different room. Like, yeah. always, if you're stuck, like, get them out of the house that they're in. Don't make it the next day. Jump ahead a week, jump ahead a month. Like, I think that's fun with writing, is that you can jump in time. Yeah. In real life, you can't jump in time. That's true. Yeah. Those are, those are actually my tricks when I'm stuck, but I think That's those are good. universal ones. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Good advice. Okay. Um, so Katie, yeah. you have this, what is, seems to be at first a small, focused story, but it touches on these huge issues that you've already talked about, you know, race, systemic racism, um, abuse, domestic abuse, and I was just wondering you were explaining what drew you to the to the story ultimately was kind of a bigger picture thing, but did you know that you were going to talk about, kind of address these issues when you started telling the story, or was it something that unfolded as you wrote? Um, I, so I did, I did know that when I started. What I didn't know was that I was gonna include myself within the frame of the book. Mm -hmm. Um, because when I first realized how I was going to tell the story, I like well, first I envisioned it as like sort of a long magazine piece, and that was what I was working on. And I would share it with my writing group, and well, first they wanted me to turn it into fiction, um, and second they would be like, I don't know, I, I don't care about this. Why do I care about this girl? She's been dead for fifty years. Yeah, like literally. And I was like, Why don't you care about this? Like this yeah. is infuriating. Like, this yeah. is what these people did. Like, this is, like, the police spent two months on her case. They did not care at all. They, like, you know, and, and I would get so fired up. And finally, when a person in my writing group was like, well, maybe if I understood why you were so interested in this, then I could. And so I was like, all right, fine. So then I started experimenting <laughs> with putting it from my point of view and, and having these layers of like this is what's going on in 1968, here's what's going on in 2022, here's what's going on in 1950 when my mother was born, when Paula's mother, or uh, when Paula was born, when, you know, and here's what's going on in 1920, you know, when Paula's mother and when my grandmother were born. And then I started seeing like all these parallels, like all these you know, women who got accidentally pregnant and had to get married, and women who were like abused by their husbands, and women who, and then the, the stories. So it was at that point that I saw that I could I could tell the story in all these other terrors. Um, but no, from the beginning I was like, I wanted to include the, I knew I would yeah. include the research. Your writing group really helped. <laughs> I hope so. so. I think some people might disagree, but thank you. <laughs> Um, so, Lori, you talked a little about synesthesia, and I love that Isabel has synesthesia. You know, it like brings her alive as a character, and it's like part of her creative expression. How did that, how did you come to using that? Oh, I, thank you. I loved writing the synesthesia, too. Um, so when I went back, you know, I was writing the book kind of in conversation with the Scarlet Letter, right? Uh, and when I went back and was reading the Scarlet Letter, of course, Hester Prynne is a, is a legal worker. And um, Hawthorne describes her work as being so spectacular. And, you know, here she's been 
given the scarlet letter and you know sent out of town and she's being banished or canceled or whatever and everybody everyone knew how to sew in that time period right in the period of time from the highest to the lowest person every woman knew how to sew and embroider and yet they were all going to Hester Prynne to ask her to pay for her to do their embroidery and so I thought well maybe um, you know maybe she was uh, um, you know, maybe she was psychotic, and I was like, no, I don't want to write that. <laughs> so then I thought, well, what else could give somebody a vision, that kind of vision? Uh, and I had, I, I knew about synesthesia because I'd worked with a student, actually, who had it, and um, then I just tried it out and um, brought it to my writing group, and uh, it worked. So I was very happy because it, it gave me a chance to put color in the book, and it's yeah. fun to write about creativity and color in, in like such a black and white world that we visually live, we live in when we're writing. So yeah, yeah, I liked I liked working with it. It was fun. Yeah, that, that's yeah. great. And Marcy, my next question for you was going to be about how your narratives kind of progress. You yeah. talked about it a little bit, but. So, I don't know. Do you have anything else to add? I just love, to me, your narratives unspool in this really real and organic way. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, I don't write with an outline, and, and there's some major, like, major plot points in this book, and they all came as a surprise to me. Like, I didn't know. Like, I, I, it would be like a big spoiler, but something, she gets hit on the head early in the book. Early, early. There it is. <laughs> I didn't know what was going to happen, and you're, like, writing, and you're, like, it's in your brain. All of a sudden, you're like, "This is gonna happen," and it just does. And so it's not planned. And like, that's really like why, like, I when I'm writing, why I love to write because I don't know what's gonna happen. Yourself. I that's surprise myself. Pretty awesome. And these dialogue. I don't know if you are with dialogue. You don't know what they're gonna say. Mm -hmm. I love that. Isn't I that? love that yeah. aspect of yeah. it. Yeah. That you're something in you knows, but you don't know. They say things, right? Like, how yeah. does that actually yeah. happen? Yeah. Right. yeah, and that's really fun. And they yeah. say things, and then you have to jump from there. So. A lot of the narrative isn't in my control, and I yeah. definitely there are times and I throw I throw writing away. If you're bored while you're writing it, then they actually, it actually is boring. And so, so I wrote a hundred pages of this book that that I threw away. Yeah, that I didn't. I, I mean, somebody told me to throw them away. My agent told me to throw them away. Oh. I know he didn't say a hundred pages. He was just like, "Aren't you going to deal with this issue?" And I was like. No, she's just gonna keep going out for turkey sandwiches. <laughs> and he was like, Love turkey sandwiches. I know, and he's like, that's good. She can keep on going out for turkey sandwiches, but she has to deal with this. And then I just cut it off. Just, and wow. he didn't tell me to do that. Okay. But so, but yeah. <laughs> this is dumb. Um, Wait, you yeah. cut off the turkey sandwiches? Well, there, there was like the a whole, whole thing. There, I cut the whole thing, but there was definitely a whole scene where she and Lori go uh -huh. to a deli and they uh -huh. order like six sandwiches. It's like a lot <laughs> so of This scene. was part of Hurricane Girl. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. it was a, no, book. nope, just a hundred pages oh, of very wow. girl. Sometimes you just have to. Yeah, it was just fun. <laughs> so I think, I think, but I think when when I do, when I'm writing and I'm really struggling, and <coughs> it's so easy just to write the next page because everybody has another day, and if that's how you're writing, if you're just writing the next page because they're having another day, and then they're really boring. Yeah. So, yeah. Sometimes you can fix it in revision. Sometimes you don't always have to cut things. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, if you all could chime in about your process. I throw out a lot of pages. I throw yeah. out so many more pages. I keep trying thinking that I'm going to get better about that, and I just seem to not. So um, I just think it's all part of the process. Yeah. Yeah. Do you work with an outline, or do you have? Well, most of my stories, this novel I'm working on now, this one, I mean, they have some, they have a character who really lived, and so there's some measure of keeping to the facts. But, you know, where you start, how you tell it, and where it ends is always up to you. Uh, and I, don't, I can't write with an outline. I, I yeah. spent six months trying to outline the book I'm working on now, and that was the most boring thing I've oh, yeah. ever done. Yeah. I was like, this is so boring. <laughs> it's it's killing me. Either. Yeah, and I mean, it, I, I didn't really use any of it, you know. So I don't like to work with an outline. I wish I could. Have you ever tried to write something that's not historical? Oh yeah, my okay. first novel okay. was not historical. Okay. I knew it was going to happen. I didn't outline it. I like to know where I'm going at the very end, and I like to be writing there. And I like to know the scenes that are going to be in along the way, but I don't outline. Okay. Yeah. In my head. Yeah. yeah keep it. In but you probably do. Katie, what about structure. when you were writing this novel? Well, so the not, the not, it's actually a really different process. So I had to outline this because I sold this book on the posing. So I, you know, I knew sort of 
I knew what I wanted to do uh, when I started writing it, but the novel's been totally different. I mean, in some respects there's an outline because it's also about a pregnant teenage girl, my, the novel. Um, and so there's like a, you know, there's like a nine months, you know, there's an arc there, like a natural arc, but, and I knew that she was going to go to maternity home. It's about, <coughs> it's like they're interrupted, but they're all pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, and so I knew that, I knew that was going to happen, but everything else has been a little bit of a surprise. It's been, actually, it's been really a, like a fun experience. I just, but I, so I finished my first draft and the advice I was given was like, just keep going. Like, don't, yes. don't oh. stop. Yeah, so, you know, like, three-fourths of the way in, I realized that, like, I needed a cat for a reason. So I just, like, wrote in the cat, but now I've got to go back and, like, add the cat. So there's a lot of, now I'm doing all this, like, adding, you know. Um, but it's been so, diff it's been such a different. I'm and, sure. And really fun, though. Yes. Oh, that's good. Yeah. You have a lot more freedom. Yeah. In yeah. some ways, yeah. And it just, like, I don't know, like, I, I can hear what Marcy says about, like, it just sort of, like, comes. Like, I'm, sh I, I'm shocked by myself, because this was not like that. Right. I mean, in, in a way, I knew where I was going, but I was, like, thinking, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you had to interview people and do research. Was that, yeah. what was that process like for Paula? What happened to Paula? I mean, it was, like, I'm, a, I'm type A in a lot of ways, and so it's like I wanted it, like, I would just, I wanted to, like, go everywhere and circle everything and, it's hard to let go, I think, of the research at some point. Um, so, you know, even up until like this book was in galleys and I was still like rereading the case file, like what if I see something different or what if like, like it, it was difficult to, um, to separate those two yeah. parts, but I don't know, I, like, I, love, I love research and I love journalism and talking to people and um, so, that was one thing that was really difficult turning to this novel, right. although because it's couched, it's also historical. In I was wondering, right? it's got a, what year? Uh, it also takes place in 1968, uh -huh. um, and it takes place in a maternity home in Kansas City that I'm basing because I'm from Kansas City, and the, there's one of the biggest maternity homes in the country. It's operating for like 60 years in Kansas City, um, and so I'm basing it on that, just like the idea of it. Mm -hmm. So there's some research there too. Mm -hmm. But the girls are all fiction. Yeah. Yeah. My own. Yeah, that's a good time for you. Yeah. And Lori, um, are there other historical books that kind of fiction, works of historical fiction that, you know, are reinventing tales like this that you that inspired you or that you love? Um you know, when I first started, I wrote about a painting. I wrote about the portrait of Adelia Black Bauer, and before that, I wrote about a Renaissance painting. And I remember the first time I knew that I wanted to write historical fiction was when they read Girl with the Pearl Earring. I mean, it was so vivid, and the colors and the chopping of vegetables and the arranging them on the plate, was, that's the opening scene. And it was so tactile, and I remember it so well. Um, and then I read Paul McLean, and I really loved um, uh, the Paris Wife, that also really influenced me, and I, yeah, I looked at that book a lot while I was working on it. Um, and the you know historical novel I just read that I thought was great, which is both historical and an update on a classic, is Damon Copperhead by um, oh, yeah. Barbara King Salva, which is really so brilliant. Um, and that is a you know an update on David Copperfield, but set in during the opioid crisis in uh, Western Virginia. And so I think that's a really great book. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Good recommendation. Yeah. Um, so I have a lot of questions, but we're getting towards the end. If anyone, does anyone want to chime in? I have a yes. quick question. Okay. Yeah. Um, did any of you or all of you uh, begin with short, a short story, short stories in general before you went to a novel? Or was you set out to do a novel first? Definitely short stories. I mean, it's funny when you take when you go to graduate school. It's so strange because everybody wants to write a novel. And when I went to graduate school, and I've heard this from so many other students. They almost don't even teach novel writing. And I think it's literally just about logistics and how much time they have. But I don't think it's great. It was just stories. And I think as a young writer, you know, it's just so much easier to write a story. Like if you can do like five pages, twenty pages, than a novel. So I think it's a great way to start. And this has actually happened twice with me now. So I've written. 
a short story with very nice and with what I'm working on right now that was a short story and you write the short story and you're like, oh, I like this and you keep going. And so I've started two novels that way. So which ones? Um, well, very nice. The first chapter was a short story, and then what I'm writing right now. And that short story actually was never published. So, but literally, I sent it to the New Yorker, it got rejected. I'm like, oh well. And so, turned it into a novel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's kind of how I wrote my first novel. Really? That you're mentioning it yeah. because I wrote a short story, and I was like, oh wait, that's not the end. Oh yeah, there's um, that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's that it was like that's just the beginning. So uh, I just knew my form was novel, and mm -hmm. I found out right then that it was, that it was novel. I think it's funny that you're saying that short stories are easier than mm. writing novels because, so I write essays, and I, and I find them to be way more difficult than writing a book. <laughs> um, just because they have to be like, perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like it, you just have to communicate so much in such a small frame, and like the, it's like the arc has to be perfect. And I mean, in a lot of ways, I see like each of these chapters is an essay, but I don't think any of them could truly stand on its own, right? Like they mean each other, um, but an essay has to stand on its own, right? It's a bit more like looseness in a novel. Yeah, novel. there's more room for yeah. <laughs> messiness. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Yes, in the back. I have a question for each of the uh, authors. From start to finish, how long did it take you to write your book? It was a really long time. I started when my right after my son was born in 2014, and it was published in 2021. So it took me three years, maybe. I mean, I had two babies in the meantime, but uh, it took me like three years to sell it, and then maybe like two to three years to write it. Uh, this took me like four and a half years, but the first two years was all those other versions that I threw away. So, did you throw them away on your own, Lori, or did you have input saying like throw this away? <laughs> um, both. Both. Yeah, yeah. Both. Both. You kind of know when it's not working. One of them I threw away on my own, but I always would send it to my to my editor. I mean, agent. My agent. Yeah. Used to be not my editor. Good God. <laughs> the agent, you let the agent tell you the dirty, yes, 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 dirty yes. hard stuff. Yes. yes, so, you know, I like to say two years, but really, four and a half. Yeah, this was a, I mean, this is a short book, it's one of my shorter ones, and it was probably just about a year and a half writing. I think a, a lot of my writing time is actually spent not writing. So, like, this maybe took me a year and a half to write, but did I write for a whole year before I started writing this book? I did it, and I think that time sort of all accrues together. My not yeah. writing time versus gestating. Yeah, or some part of the process. You have to get really, really sad because you're not writing. I talked to another writer today, she, and I won't, she said the same thing to me though, so it was nice to hear. It's not yes. just me. Like, you have to get miserable to start working. It's a terrible <laughs> system. But then you're like notoriously fast. I feel like Marcy's like, yeah. I'm not working anything. Oh, I just finished. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why. Yeah. When she says she's not working. Right. She's it's working. Right. Brain How long did your book take for? Yeah. Uh, this new one? I would say two, two years. Yeah, two years. That's I, what I think every book should take. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't. Right. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't uh -huh. always. I know. Yeah. This one was faster or something. Like, I draft really, really fast, several months, it's terrible, like terrible, terrible, and then revise for a really long time. Mm -hmm. That works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Arthur, did you have a question? Um, when you took uh, Hester, how much background research did you need to do? I did a lot, um, because, so that's part of that the reason my books take a long time besides that I throw away a lot of pages. So I read all about, once I knew Hawthorne, the lead character, I read all about Hawthorne, um, which, which tri the witch tri the Salem witch trials are in here, so I read some of the transcripts from the witch trials, and then there's witch trials from Scotland, and I read some of those transcripts, and then there's synesthesia, and I did that, and then there's Salem in 1829, so I did that, and I, I, I researched that. So I spend a lot of time researching. So obviously I do like the research, but I do like the research when I know where it's going. I have, there's an underground railroad subplot in here, so I had to research um, the history of slavery in New England, and then uh, 
you know, how the Underground Railroad was first begun and the history of free black people in Salem in 1820, in like the 1820s, so a lot. And I went, I went to Salem a couple of times, and it was great because my other books have been set, my other historical novels were set in Europe. And while it was great going to Italy and Austria, I mean, I'm not going to complain, um, it was much more expedient to be able to go to Salem. Yeah, especially since it was the pandemic. Oh, right. Yeah. And then nothing had to be translated for me to research. That was also good. Yeah. So you've all three been out promoting books fairly recently. What do you love, like about that process, that part of it, I guess? So what do you dislike? What? I like this. Yeah. I like talking about yeah. writing I was with other writers. That. You know, that's what I like. Same. Yeah. Yeah. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this moment is the peak. That's <laughs> 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 okay. Now we're set it Be careful. Yeah. Uh, oh yes. Um, Marcy, last night I was looking at Sarah Jessica Parker's Instagram um, oh. of Ferris. But um, you're on it. Like, I know. So how did that happen? I'm just curious. Oh, that was, it was just like last night when I saw it. I, I know. Thought. It was just great. I mean, she read very nice somehow. Like, I'm sure like she gets sent a gazillion books. And she, she read very nice. And she really loved that one. And I didn't get an Instagram post with that. She posted like her 10 favorite books of the summer. And it was in there. Yeah. yeah. We're from the same hometown in a way. Like, I think we're not close. But I think she's aware of it. I don't actually know if she's aware of it. But she's in New Jersey, right? She's from New Jersey. She's okay. from Teaneck and she's from Englewood. Okay. And so she actually requested Hurricane Girl. Okay. And there was this funny day because of the pandemic. I literally only went into my publisher's office once. And my editor wasn't even there. I just wanted to like sign some books or something. And on that same day, she had requested the book. So I was there. And I gave out little cat cards. Like I, That was my... That was my pre-promotion thing, I just like, if you buy my book early, I'll send you a cat card that, she paints. that I paint. Yeah. So I sent Sarah Jessica Parker a cat card, and so I got to that's sign what it. Did it. I know that's what <laughs> did it. And yeah, there you go. So yeah. yeah. But we've never actually met in real life, but she has met my sister. It's cool, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, yeah. Thought, I was just like, wow, that's fun. And I know. And picture of like drawing, and I thought it was cool that you put it Yeah, that's how that happened. Yeah. So that was just really good timing that I was in, I was in the office the day mm -hmm. she asked for it. I have two of Marcy's cat drawings yeah. right on my desk wall, like the wall. Of my They're office. still available. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you see, you have flowers. And flowers, yeah. 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 Is there a cat in There is a cat. There are two cats in there, my cats. And, and I have two cats. That's very, see, that's very autobiographical. Like, I'm not just any cat. I still get out of there. I put my cats. I do. I, it's, so, it's so annoying. I put my cats. And I was really happy to hear that there's a cat in your book. <laughs> that was good. You're on the right track. The, the cat is inadvertently uh, responsible for the duck blonde girls. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so really? they're a cat. That's yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. But you should know that people get very upset if you kill animals. Mm -hmm. But if the, the cat, cat, cat kills the person, girl, it's fine. It's, it's, fine. <laughs> it's totally fine. <laughs> people you can kill. My okay. daughter won't, yeah. is a voracious reader, and she won't read it. I book if there's a dead dog. Oh. She told me that. Yeah, 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 yeah. People wrote to me up there, like, Dear Marcy, I'm reading very nice, and I'm really worried about the dog, and is it going to die? <laughs> oh, I got that. Oh, email. I'm like, no, the dog lives, and they finish the book. <laughs> oh, <Wow. laughs> Uh, it's a, authors are really accessible. <laughs> yeah, right. Unfortunately. Yeah, it is sometimes. Right? Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it's nice. That makes me sorry. That makes me think about I had there was a woman that was like as she was reading my book, she was basically like live emailing me. Like, so yeah. wow. I was I they should be less accessible, right? Yeah. yeah. I like I, I broke her brain a little bit. <laughs> Well, thank you. Oh, yeah. is there a last question? Are there a book for? Oh, good. Last question. Yeah. Do you all have some books? If you want to yeah. buy their books, they have some books with them. Um, thank you, three, so much for coming. Yeah. Yeah, it's wonderful. And in two weeks, we have another special conversation with Bob Dreyfus, who happens to be in the front row here. Not Keith. He, not Keith. Not Keith. <laughs> not a Keith. He is an investigative reporter, and he is going to speak about the U.S.-Iran conflict and the Islamic regime based on his extensive travels as a reporter. 
So come for that in two weeks on April 27th. And if you haven't signed up for my email list, there's a sign up sheet over there and there are flyers and brochures over there too. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.